Donald. You're broke and busted. A fraud. A con. A low-rent rip-off artist. We've always known it. So have you. Now America knows it. The courts are shutting down your crooked shell companies in New York. Bank fraud. Insurance fraud. You know those are crimes, right Donald? They're dissolving the whole Trump Organization scam right from under you. Bankruptcy won't save you this time. You'll have to sell off everything. You might even lose control of that dump Trump Tower. No one will lend you money, Donald. They won't even let you hand it over to Junior or Eric. Never mind Ivanka. She hates you. Everything you ever built was built on a lie. You were never rich, never successful. New York is laughing at you. Always has. Always will. And now everyone knows it. Broke. Busted. The loser in chief. My guest today is Reed Galen, co-founder of The Lincoln Project and host of The Lincoln Project podcast. He's an independent political strategist who has spent years advising Fortune 50 companies and has also worked on several prominent Republican campaigns. Reed, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ken. You have figured out at The Lincoln Project how to get inside Trump's head. Was that part of the strategy from the the beginning, from the creation of the Lincoln Project, or did you come to that realization later that the things you were doing, the the videos you were putting out, weren't just speaking to voters, but they were they were being mainlined by the former president? Um, it, first and foremost, thanks for having me, Ken. Um, you know, it actually goes back to a year or even more before. Uh, the Lincoln Project launched, uh, there would be these meetings of very earnest establishment Republicans in these beautiful salons in Washington, D.C. And everybody would sit around and go, okay, we have to make Trump look like a loser. You know, we have to get him on policy. Um, there would be the idea of, okay, well, we have to separate him from the party, right? He's not really a Republican. And I would sit there, Rick Wilson, my co-founder, would sit there and others who were more in the, I would say, fighting vein of the attendees, less the um, sort of, you know, inside the beltway class and be like, this isn't going to work, guys. Like, I understand what you're trying to say, but you have to go at him. You have to go after him individually, directly, and all the time. Because, you know, if you call him a jerk, right, he doesn't care. And the people that love him, love him because he's a jerk right if you call him every name you know you make fun of his hair you make fun of his skin you make fun of his weight like all that stuff like has a little bit of an effect but the reason why we ultimately decided that what we call the audience of one strategy was effective was a couple of things logistical he's a he's a lonely cranky sad old man ken he doesn't have any friends Right. So he sits in front of the television, in front of Fox News every night and yells at the TV with, you know, his TiVo in one hand and his phone in the other. And so we knew that in the context of 2020, especially remember, this is deep COVID. He's just sitting in the residence by himself like, you know, Melania is not hanging out with him. Barron's not hanging out with him. Nobody else is hanging out with him. So he's just sitting there with an overdone cheeseburger and French fries. And so we very quickly realized that you could directly talk to him. Because remember, remember like Jim Carrey and the cable guy, like where TV was the medium of his youth? That's for Trump, too. Still, even now, TV is his main medium. It's what if he sees it on television, he believes it. And so um, what was necessary to do was to find a way to break through the reality distortion field that Trump has been incredibly successful at creating for himself because when when you pierce that bubble he can't handle it um and that's why you see you know whether or not it was almost four years ago when we launched this 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 ad called morning in america which was sort of the hal rainey 1984 ad in the minor key about how badly america was going to suffer from COVID under his his leadership such such as it was um he went nuts and this is the other secret is if he had just ignored us four years ago, Kim, um, you wouldn't, you and I probably wouldn't be having this conversation. No one really ever would have heard of us, but because he attacked us on Twitter by name, organizationally and by name individually, we went from a, you know, a, a, you know, a sort of a quirky little interesting band to people raising, you know, 10, 11, $12 million a month 
all directly aimed at him. I want to play that ad and then ask you about it afterwards. There's mourning in America. Today, more than 60,000 Americans have died from a deadly virus Donald Trump ignored. With the economy in shambles, more than 26 million Americans are out of work. The worst economy in decades. Trump bailed out Wall Street, but not Main Street. This afternoon, millions of Americans will apply for unemployment. And with their savings run out, many are giving up hope. Millions worry that a loved one won't survive COVID-19. There's mourning in America. And under the leadership of Donald Trump, our country is weaker and sicker and poorer. And now, Americans are asking, if we have another four years like this, will there even be an America? So, Reed, is this a new thing in political messaging? The audience of one idea. I've never seen it before. Um, I think people have questioned its effectiveness. I don't, because you get inside his OODA loop. Uh, are you familiar with <laughs> that right. term? Of course, yes. In, in oh, military yes. military parlance. Explain yeah, that. absolutely. I read the book. Great. Explain the advantages of disrupting the opponent's um, decision-making strategy. Sure. Well, I mean, I think the the thing to understand about Trump is it's not it, look, it, it really has it's a double edged sword for Trump. One is it makes our Democratic friends really happy. Right. And it gets attention from the earned me from the mainstream media and earned media. And that's really where the, the view count ticks up. Right. Because as soon as members of the media start picking it up, it just it sort of takes on a life of its own. But the the purpose the strategic purpose behind it was twofold one as you said was to to get inside his head and remember that for a guy like donald trump he is the alpha and the omega of his operation it begins and ends with him it's to your point about normal political messaging most of the time you have a presidential candidate they're on the road all the time or if they are if they're at home they're not watching television right and so if you shoot an ad directly at them like there's a really good chance they're not going to see it. And even if they saw it, like they'd ignore it because like, it's just not the thing they're going to do. And if it was so over the top and so egregious and so offensive or whatever the thing was, right, that the campaign had to respond, then the campaign would respond, right? Not, not the candidate on Twitter, right? Or, or, you know, sc screaming to a New York Times reporter. It's just not how it normally works. But so you, you have Morning in America, then right after... George Floyd's murder, we put out an ad called Flag of Treason. And this was about the Confederate flag. And it was basically asking Trump whether or not he was going to stand with the American flag or the Confederate flag. Now, we knew that he would go crazy, but he wouldn't go after the Confederate flag as a symbol of racism, you know, disunity, treason, whatever it was, because it was the strategic box canyon we wanted him in, right? Which was we wanted him to, by omission, defend the Confederate flag, if that makes sense, which would then, in the context of that moment, right, where there was so much racial tension, push him further and further away from the mainstream. Then, you know, look, we had China, we got his campaign manager fired, right? And so all of that through his campaign into Toma, look, people would say, it's really not cool to make ads about Ivanka Trump. Okay, well, you know, it wasn't great for Jared and Ivanka to kill half a million Americans either, but they did. And so why did we do that? Because we knew that either she would see it or somebody else would see it and go tell her. And she would run down the hall of the West Wing to the Oval Office and go, Daddy, Daddy, did you see what they just did? Right? And because, again, everything starts and ends with him, that gets them, and this was the strategic purpose in that moment, was to get him to focus on us, right, as his prime uh, opponent, as opposed to Joe Biden, whose campaign was still sort of getting up and running. This messaging strategy only works with a person like Trump as the target. It's it's not replicable. You can't go after Joe Biden the same way if you're on the other side. It seems like a once in a lifetime opportunity for a, a political messaging person uh, like like you. Do you think Trump will ever learn that he's being 
played every time you run one of these ads and get inside his head? It doesn't seem like he will. And we only got a few months left. Yeah, he, he probably won't. Um, I know that his people have been all over him about, you know, not responding to anything. Yeah. Right. Which is very difficult for him. Um, but, you know, it's it's really, you know, sometimes it's time and place. Sometimes you run it and he sees it. Uh, more often you run it and, um, you know, and he, and he sees it and he'll say something. But also, look, here's the other part, too, is even if you don't, even if he doesn't see it, because, again, remember, this is about rifle shots, not shotgun shells, is you can run it into Mar-a-Lago or Bedminster, where he spends most of his time on Fox News locally, right, on the local cable station. And then if you really want to screw with him, right, you put it on, say, the Golf Channel and ESPN during the day so the guys at the clubhouse see it because they're going to tell him, right? And so even if he doesn't see it personally, it'll infect the ecosystem. Now, I will say the other person this worked with was Ron DeSantis um, because he was also just so thin-skinned. But the difference was is that there was a, I think it was a couple of years ago, he had sort of snubbed Trump, but there was a hurricane, uh, you know, coming, and so they had evac- they had they had activated the emergency operations center there in Tallahassee. So we started running ads, taunting DeSantis on the Weather Channel because they had it running in the big EOC, right? And so everybody's going nuts. But again, for the most part, this doesn't work, right? It has to be a very thin-skinned, flinty self-obsessed, self-obsessed, you know, absorbed narcissist to really get it to work. Well, you take micro-targeting to a whole new <laughs> level. I, I didn't right. realize you were actually thinking through what channel he's watching at what time of the day. It really is an audience of one. I mean, you're thinking through it uh, that that carefully. Yeah, look, I mean, he just, I mean, he watches Fox News, the night side, right? So it, uh, you know, but Hannity's his favorite because mm-hmm. Hannity's been his his number one cheerleader for however long. So, I mean, Hannity, when Tucker was on, right? But, yeah, the, you know, that 9, 10 p.m., you know, he stays up late, he gets up late. Um, you know, it, it's it's not that hard to find him. And again, he's sitting in the bridal suite at Mar-a-Lago. He, you know, he, you know, he could play DJ in the dining room all he wants, but at the, at the end of the day, like, he goes by himself, right? There's nobody hanging out with him. What's the best response you've gotten from him? Can you share an example of of a case where one of your ads has gotten inside his decision loop, disrupted a uh, a messaging cycle from his campaign, and and gotten them off message? I mean, make the case for this audience of one strategy. Sure. So back in December, um, you know, we'd about had it with all of the mainstream news stories about uh, Joe Biden's age. Okay. Joe Biden's old. So is Donald Trump. The difference is Donald Trump's old and insane, right? And, 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 you know, malicious. And so we, and you know, the, there's a saying you, you can cut the, the, cut these ads with scissors, right? That's how easy they are. Um, and so you just line up 40, you know, 54 seconds worth of Trump, not knowing where he is, miss mispronouncing somebody's name, having one of those sort of sort of, you know, things he has put that up in early December. Then what happens? You know, he, he, he goes on his truth social thing and accuses us of using AI to create that ad. Now, why did we create the ad? We created the ad to make him realize that he too is old, right? He's scared to death of death, right? I mean, he's a germaphobe. He's vaccinated to the gills, right? He doesn't like being around people if he doesn't have to be because he's really scared of dying. Okay. I mean, that's, that's not an unre- that's not an unreasonable fear, but he's got it to the nth degree. But what did he do? He then attacked us. And then that created what, you know, you have the OODA loop and then you have the Streisand effect, right? Which is if he had just ignored it, it probably would have come and gone. But instead, his reacting to it elevated the conversation, magnified the effect of it. And you know what happens? Two, three, four weeks later, as Iowa is happening, and now all these national reporters are in place, and they're seeing him up close for the first time in weeks or maybe probably months, they're like, oh, God, he really has lost it. Yep. Can you explain the OODA loop? We're talking like military bros, but I'm sure some people are wondering what we're talking about. The OODA loop and the Streisand effect on brilliant display every time you do one of these things. Right, so it's uh, is it observe, orient, 
decide uh, decide act right um and so you see what's going on okay you orient yourself to the profile of the situation you're in you decide to do something and then you act right and as soon as you act you you are immediately ready for that response you're observing the response you're orienting to that response you're deciding what to do and then you act again right and so because you know the Lincoln project and and very dynamic political organizations can move so fast cuz we're flat right there's no real decision tree you can go 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 while you know other you know a campaign right a candidate campaign can as you know can take minutes if you're lucky hours if you're lucky but more likely days at least half a day to make a decision on how to respond to something right and the good news is Trump Trump actually operates close to real time as well. The difference is he's it's just whatever's coming out of his head whereas we're like what's the effect we're trying to have and how can we amplify it by keeping after him. Um you know look it, it, it as you know too you can that you have to get that fly that ooh to flywheel spinning too. Sometimes you do it and it just sort of goes and stops. Uh but that doesn't mean you stop you stop doing it as a means of action if that makes sense. What are the other major changes in this industry if you will? Obviously speed is is a new thing. A generation ago you could think about your response, you didn't have to react instinctively. Now you do. Um what are the other elements of the the new political messaging economy and I'll get to the point here that Democrats haven't quite figured out yet. Um well a couple of things and I think this is something that everyone is still contending with I think some are better at it than others um you know if you think about 4 years ago um Twitter was the thing this was pre Elon right Facebook was still the thing for a lot of people but really as a fundraising mechanism at least for us more than anything uh Instagram was there and it was big um and then you had obviously Google and YouTube um now you know you have so many more cord cutters right that don't get broadcast television and you, we could we could do 3 hours on the the inefficacy of broadcast television as a medium um cable television still has some utility but now you have smart TVs right where like I don't know about you Ken but if I'm watching something on Hulu with ads like I don't know how many prostate cancer ads I get I mean they've got me <laughs> dialed in right but I watch the same ad like 8 times like they're not very it's not very sophisticated yet um then you have TikTok which suddenly roared in and gobbled up you know 90% of the eyeballs of people 35 and under right um and it's got its own weird algorithms and it's got its own weird styles uh and look here I'll be 48 on Friday right like I have a TikTok account but I never know what's going to work and what's not because like it's not really meant for me and it's not really meant for the people I'm talking to um and so what I would say is this is that you know video you you said this right before we went on is that you know the video plays of your podcast get 10x what the audio listens do because video is the thing right the like, i listen to podcasts with walking the dogs or I'm in the car whatever but a lot of people especially if they work from home right they have time to watch video on youtube or instagram or wherever it is and so um i think twitter is far less efficient than it ever was it ever has been and it's also clogged up with so much ugliness that Elon has allowed back, you know, onto the platform that, you know, you really have to dig through it. I wouldn't be surprised if there are groups and I have no proof of this, but it wouldn't surprise me if Elon has certain groups, especially those who are maybe in the pro-democracy space throttled, right? So that it's less effective or your stuff comes up right alongside some awful, you know, Christian nationalist or, you know, some, you know, horrible racist. Um and so I think that you know speed still matters but I think at the end of the day you still have to have the content right that that is going to drive something and for for me anyway um and this goes to your a long answer to your question about democrats is you have to remember that politics is an emotional game um you're trying to evoke a response in someone from in here but they're going to make their decision up here Um and so this is going to this is going to sort of get them to the right place and then we're going to wrap rationality around it to make sense to ourselves. And so you still have to do that. So when you see um an ad about Ukraine, right? If I do an ad to you about Ukraine to soft Republicans in Wisconsin, right? 
Is it about bombs and bullets? Well, that's the end result, right? We need $60 billion to make sure they have the, the gear and the armament and everything else they need to fight the Russians. But it's really a value proposition is how do you see yourself as an American, right? How do you see America's place in the world? Do you see us as a leader, as a beacon of liberty? Or do you see us as, as Trump says, just one more country that kills people and, oh, you think we're so great? And I think that there's a lot of Americans, but I think a sizable number of Republicans too, who don't believe that. They don't want to believe America is that way. And so that's where I think sometimes Democrats get caught up in issues, right? Issues are fine, right? Um, but, you know, I always think about like prescription drugs. I remember going door to door in East Las Vegas in, you know, late October, 2022. And it's me and a local volunteer. She was terrific. And we go to a, we go to a guy's door. This is a rough neighborhood, Ken. And, you know, he answers the door and she starts, you know, so-and-so, we, uh, you know, <clears throat> let's talk about prescription drugs. I got my ballot. I don't care. Well, let me tell you about what Senator so-and-so is going to do prescription drugs. And my ex, I'm on my ex-wife's policy. I don't care. And so then you have to go, you know, he's like, they're all crooks. And I go, look, I get it. I know exactly where you're coming from. There are days I believe you, right? I agree with you. But like, here's the thing is this is your only chance to have a voice. And it may not be a big voice, but it's yours, right? And it took me five, seven, nine minutes. And at the end of that, Ken, the conversation went from, I'm not going to look at it to, I'm not gonna, I'll look at it, but I'm not going to promise you I'll vote. Okay, well, I got him halfway there, but that took 10 minutes, right? at someone's door and it wasn't because of prescription drugs it was because like where do you do you want to sit there and look at that ballot and say i had the chance and i didn't take it i don't think most people given the option would do that yeah how does your work interface with like that ground game because at the end of the day you're right hearts and minds are going to be changed through conversations like that it's something we talk about in in the film against all enemies it's got to be loved ones talking to people they care about saying you know come on uh, don't don't fall for this guy um and and changing them that way obviously there's there's got to be a um a, an entire strategy reaching voters getting inside trump's head all of that do you think about the the ground game and and how the lincoln project folds into that um, I do. I mean, the Lincoln Project has a has a a, a, a group called the Union, uh, which is about join the Union If you're interested, That's right. about seventy thousand volunteers nationwide, and you know, and about a hundred partner organizations. So that's the really the main interface into the grassroots. But I'll say this is, I, I mean, I think Ken, we're going to see, and and you've probably experienced this in your time in the military. Maybe it's like Afghanistan, right? It's like. Uh, uh, a special forces operator on horseback with like a satellite receiver calling in an airstrike, right? It's it's the 15th century meets the 21st century. And, and I think the that's, airstrike. Yeah, yeah, but like you still got to have the guys on the horses, right? Right, um, Because they've got to say, okay, this is exactly where we need to be. And I think that you're going to have this high-tech targeting stuff. And look, you can basically, if if I had your cell phone number, Ken, which I think I do, I'm sure I do, like I could target you wherever it is you are, right? I, and, and I can, I have your number because we know each other, but I could buy that too, right? Any campaign can buy that information and target your phone, right? And so the, the ability to target literally one-on-one -on -one is very scary, but to your point about the personal interaction, and I really do believe this, is I think that the ground game may be as important this year as it's ever been in decades. Me too. Because there's that, Again, that you're going to have a better experience or more realistic experience with this. It's like your crew, right? Like if you're if you guys were a drone crew and you each had your little pod in a bunker somewhere, right? Like you know, you get in your things, you'd put your you know you'd put your flight suits on, right? You have your coffee, you get your pods, you do your work, you get out of your flight suits, you say, "All right, see you, Bob," right? But like you're on that aircraft together right? You're training together. You're in the air for however many hours together. And there's that friction that it's, it's almost like Velcro, right? That starts to the hooks and the, in the loops that start to stick together. And I think that's where the in-person stuff really is important. And again, being at someone's door is still the only way that you can get unfettered, unfiltered contact with somebody. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't have my phone with me at the moment, but like everybody has their phone all the time. But do you answer the door with the phone in your hand? I don't, but I, I mean, I guess I might if it was in my pocket, but for the most part, I don't answer the door with my phone in my hand. 
So I think that it's got to be a lot of high tech and a lot of low tech. What's your favorite Lincoln Project campaign? Is there one that you're just really proud of? I mean, 20 was great, but, I, you know, 2022, I thought was really, um, really, I thought a great exemplar of the way that, you know, we need to think about, you know, fighting for democracy yeah. in the 21st century. So in 2022, it's the midterm. Most people are thinking about the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, um, legislative seats, statewide seats in different in different states. And we said that's not how we want to look at it. We want to look at it, okay, what are the races that are going to matter most for 2024? Because that's for us, the you know, the big enchilada. And so it came down to, it just happened to work out this way that in Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, they all had gubernatorial races. And some of them, I think Arizona, Nevada, uh, Michigan, uh, yeah, and Michigan had secretaries of state races too, right? So we focused on those places um, so that we could make sure that come 2024, in this case, you know, a pro de pro democracy candidates or pro democracy officials, they happen to be Democrats because that's the only pro democracy party left, were in power. So Katie Hobbs and Adrian Fontes in Arizona. Um, I can't recall the secretary of state in Nevada, but that's a Democrat there. Joe Lombardo's the Republican governor, but like, you know, he's a cop. He's probably not stealing anything. Tony Evers wins in Wisconsin. Gretchen Whitmer and Jocelyn Benson win in Michigan. And then Josh Shapiro just blows, uh, what's his name? Crazy Mastriano out of the water. And again, that's an appointed position. So like those were the places we saw as the keys to moving the Democratic ball forward. Some people could say it was the House. Some people could say it was the Senate. But again, you know, the truth is, is that most of this stuff that's going to matter, you know, we're 50 independent states with different rules and everything else. This November, we'll have 50 individual elections, right, that will ladder up to an electoral college count. Um, and so I, that was the one where I was most proud of understanding. And it really, it's it's just, it's not me. It's the, it was the political and the, and the targeting guys who said, here's really the strategy we should follow. Because again, not having a candidate, not having a party, gives you a lot of flexibility to say, okay, what do we need to do? Where do we need to do it? And how can we best apply the skills we have to go make it happen? It's Ken Harbaugh on the Midas Touch Network, the film Against All Enemies, which I co-produced with Ben Micellis and this network, is the number one documentary on Apple TV, and it's now available on Amazon. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out and please leave a review. It really does make a huge difference in helping spread the word. Thanks Midas Mighty, let's use our power well. Living a more heart healthy life fuels everything I do. Introducing three in one blood pressure support plus CoQ10 from Super Beats Heart Chews Advanced. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the grapeseed extract in Super Beats is clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. New Super Beats Heart Chews Advanced supports healthy CoQ10 levels, an important nutrient for heart health. As a dad, now into my 50s, Heart health is more important than ever. I plan on being around a good long while, and that means looking after my heart. Thankfully, Super Beats makes that super easy. It contains a powerful three-in-one formula for healthy blood pressure, which features grapeseed extract, beetroot powder, and CoQ10. There are no pills to swallow, no ingredients to mix or prepare, it's plant-based and with no artificial sweeteners or colors, and it contains effective and clinically researched ingredients. Super Beats gives you heart healthy energy without the crash. And Super Beats supports healthy circulation without stimulants. Find out how you can get a free 30 day supply on bundles of new Super Beats Heart Shoes Advanced and save 15% by going to getsuperbeats.com. That's getsuperbeats.com. If someone would have told me that there are science backed ingredients that could help me feel 15 years younger in a matter of months, I wouldn't have believed it. Then I tried Qualia Senolytic. As we age, everyone accumulates senescent cells in their body. Senescent cells cause symptoms of aging, such as aches and discomfort, slow workout recoveries, sluggish mental and physical energy associated with that middle age feeling. 
also known as zombie cells. These are old and worn out and not serving a useful function for our health anymore, but they are taking up space and nutrients from our healthy cells. Much like pruning the yellowing and dead leaves off a plant, qualisenolytic removes those worn out senescent cells to allow for the rest of them to thrive in the body. The formula is non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, and the ingredients are meant to complement one another, factoring in the combined effect of all the ingredients together. Qualiacenolytic has a 100-day money-back guarantee. Resist aging at the cellular level. Try Qualiacenolytic. Go to neurohacker.com slash boats for up to $100 off and use code boats at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's neurohacker.com slash boats for an extra 15% off your purchase. Thanks to Neurohacker for sponsoring today's episode. I'm going to get a little personal here uh, because I've talked to a lot of your co-conspirators over at the Lincoln Project and I'm struck by how different their motivations are for doing the work they're doing compared to other political operatives. I mean, it's, it's largely patriotism, but there are, are elements of, like in the case of Stuart Stevens, some guilt and some shame. And that's a level of emotional honesty you don't normally get from political operatives. What drives you as a former Republican to charge so hard at the the party you uh, you once belonged to, the the head of the party. Um, I, I mean, what what is what is getting you out of bed every day to, frankly, take real risks, not just professionally but personally, to do this work? Um, you know, I, I think it's a couple of things. One is, um, and you know, I'm an amateur historian, mm-hmm. right? So, like, I I have plenty of. Stuff you know, I got I got forty books lined up here. Ken, I still haven't read that I've got to get through, right? But I read a lot of history. Um, I have a very deep understanding of, you know, the history of authoritarian movements and how they work, um, and understanding. And you know, look, my you know my my family left. You know, I don't know if it was Poland or Lithuania or Belarus at the time, but we like we left in like 1905, right? We got the hell out of Dodge um, in Eastern Europe. But I think about what happens when authoritarians become totalitarians. And we see that in a place like Russia now, or China, right? Uh, where life is arbitrary. Um, and and I don't like that. I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a small L liberal, I'm a small D Democrat. Um, I still have enough of a libertarian streak in me to say like, I don't like any, well, listen, I'm unemployable other than this, Ken, right? Like, I don't like being told what to do. Um, but the other, the, but that all, you know, goes into this sort of, un, you know, undying belief. And I think that's really what has been the driver of underneath all of it in any successful uh, organization like this is it, it's you got to believe in it. You can't, you can't phone it in. And to your point, like, you know, the professional stuff, okay. The personal stuff, you know, you got to take that stuff seriously. But you have to ask yourself, you know, it's, it's like that, that, um, that great line from Patton, right? You know, when your grandson's sitting on your knee and he says, Granddad, what did you do in the Great World War II? You won't have to say, well, I shoveled shit in Louisiana, right? Like, I, I, this sounds really strange and it probably sounds incredibly self-serving, Ken, but if there's going to be a fight for our time, I'm sure as hell glad I'm here for it, if that yeah, makes sense. Me too. Um, because to your point, going to bed at night, did I do what I could? I did. Do you always do the best you could? Do you always do everything you could? No. But you wake up in the morning And you don't have to look in the mirror going, what am I doing to myself? Or what have I rationalized away? And I have lots of friends, Ken, like that, who have done that. Some of them are in the deep end of the Trump swimming pool. Others are in the kiddie pool saying, I have a business, I have this, I have that, or I don't want to get involved. And that's their choice. Um, Do I fault some of them for it? Those that I know know better, yeah. Others, I just have to say, I'm not surprised. And if I'm not surprised, why am I going to spend my time getting upset? Are you ever surprised that that we're friends i mean the alliances that have formed to to meet this moment this political moment have they're the kinds of relationships i never would have imagined just a few years ago we should be at each other's throats but we're not because of the moment we're in do you ever pinch yourself and think wow these are crazy times and the people i thought were friends are not and the people i thought were political foes uh, are actually on the same side. 
Um, probably not so much anymore just because we've been, I mean, we launched four and a half years ago. Yeah. Uh, so we've been at it a long time, but I will say this is that again, I think it goes back to that belief that, you know, we're all in this together. Um, look, there are some people who don't want to work with us for whatever reason, whether it's the name or we're former Republicans and like, that's fine. Coalition fighting is hard, as you know. It's never, it's never easy and everybody's got competing interests. Uh, but what I like to say, Ken, is we don't have to agree on everything. We just have to agree on one thing. And look, uh, the truth is, is that my evolution has probably taken me much closer to your place in the world than where I started. Let's be clear. When I was a kid or even a younger Republican, you could be a Republican, you could be a conservative, or you could be a conservative Republican. I was always just a Republican, right? Like, I'm not a social conservative. You know, uh, I, I was Jewish. You know, I went to Hebrew school till I was 12. You know, went to church for a little while. So, you know, I'm sort of, I'm sort of in and out of faith, right? Um, but it was really, you know, muscular foreign policy, you know, ec you know, economics, America's place in the world. That was what kept me there. But, you know, I, you know, then I moved to California, and I realized, like, I, you know, you live in a place like California, Ken. Like, if if you're not going to make friends with Democrats, you're going to be alone. <laughs> um, but I, I would say that it. It doesn't surprise me so much anymore, um, but I'll say this is that, you know, we always make the joke, like, I wish we could go back to arguing about marginal tax rates, right? Um, like that's, I mean, I worked on the 2004 Bush campaign, right? Like that was a major bone of contention between Bush and Kerry, whether the top marginal tax rate was going to be like 36.8 or 35.4. And think about that. I mean, that was a Democrat in 2004, like sub 40% for wealthy people. Like think about that, right? So just think about how far the windows move. And so am I surprised? Not anymore. Um, but I will also say this is that I have been overwhelmingly heartened by all of the people. And I have met thousands of people in this journey from, you know, coast to coast who are dedicated to the cause. Most of them you're never going to know their names. Most of their organizations, you're never going to hear of. They do incredible work. They're understaffed. They're underpaid. And they get up every day because they believe in it. And, you know, that's what makes the country great. Um, you know, we, we have all this other stuff. We have the biggest economy and the most toys and the biggest army and everything else. But the truth is, is that, like, there are individual Americans out there who are working day and night to make sure that, you know, come November, the good guys win. And there are good guys and bad guys. That's the other part. Like, we should be very clear. Like, in a policy debate, Ken, you can absolutely have shades of gray, right? Yeah, because ultimately policy is going to devolve to compromise. That's just how things work. In a campaign, it's a binary choice. You win or you lose. There's no moral victory in a campaign, right? You can say, oh, we came close. Okay, great. St still, you're sitting at home while the other guy goes and, you know, takes an oath, you know, an oath to the Constitution. Um, and so what I would say is this, is that like, it is a black and white fight. Uh, and if you have the ability to get off the sideline and on the right side, it, from my perspective, it's up to you as an American to do that. Yeah, I'm with you hundred percent. I think one of our great strengths as a movement is that belief that you've talked about. And I know there are fervent diehard Trump supporters among the rank and file but I, I look at the leadership of that movement, and to a person, they all seem like cynics to me. Their hearts aren't really in it morally. They've rationalized intellectually, but they don't actually believe the election was stolen. They don't actually believe the QAnon nonsense. They're, they're performative. Uh, and, and I think that is, that is to our benefit. Uh, I think you're right. And I, I mean, well, I would say this about Trump is Trump doesn't have any innate belief other than in himself. Right. Um, so that you have to sort of put him aside. But the rest of them, Hawley, Cruz, um, Cotton, Stefanik, you name it, like they, they, they all know what they're doing. And in some ways, Ken, they they worry me more because what they have said is, to your point, I'm willing to trade everything to be this person. And if this is what I need to be and what I need to do, I think that there's there's no limit to the things that they would do to maintain that sort of fervor of the convert, right? They all have to convert. Uh, their people are true believers. And look, just think about, uh, you know, it was like a year and a half ago or so when Trump 
said, you got, you know, he was, I think in Alabama, he was at a rally. He's like, go out and get vaccinated. He got booed, right? Like those are the true believers. That's ultra MAGA staring you at the face. And, you know, Cruz, I mean, look, and that's the other part. Like these people all lie, right? They're all the elite. They all went to Ivy League colleges, right? Like I'm a state school guy, right? Like I, I know BS when I see it. I've known Cruz since 2000. I've seen him up close for a long time. Like none of this surprises me. He's always been this person right he's always been this person and it was you know like so much in life it was the path of least resistance i can go this way it's the right way but it's troublesome and my career might end or i can go this way what do i care right these rubes they're going to give me all their money right and then the billionaires are going to give me their money and then we're going to do whatever's best for us and probably the billionaires and we'll be in charge and you know what nobody cares anyway because to your point it's a nihilism of you know, lull, nothing matters. You shared this observation with me once that the only people they hate more than us is themselves. I mean, it really is a den of vipers in that way when fundamental beliefs beliefs aren't undergirding anything you're doing. I mean, it, it leads to just this vicious inner fighting. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you let's take what's going, let's take an, a, a real example, a real time example, which is Marjorie Taylor Greene is after Speaker Mike Johnson. Right. Okay. Now, they got rid of Kevin McCarthy, who was not a true believer, and everybody knew he wasn't a true believer, right? But he was willing to play the game. Um, they got rid of him. And then they got, you know, a backbencher in Johnson. And now she's after him. Um, and my guess is she's after him simply to scare him away on Ukraine. Or, or immigration, take your pick, whatever it is. But she doesn't care about the country and she doesn't care about governing. She only cares about making sure that she's in the middle of something and she gets all the attention or as much of the attention as she can. Um, excuse me. Again, if, if any of these guys had to knife one another, metaphorically, of course, to get, to get ahead, they would in a heartbeat. They would not stop. Um, because again, at the end of the day, they don't care about anything, right? It's not about, it's not about the opportunity to serve America. It's about the opportunity to turn Americans into subjects, if that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, it lacks. There's no, there's no, there's no coherent morality. There's no coherent philosophy. There's no co coherent political, you know, program. Because again, it's all about. Look, they're a gang, Ken. Power, money, territory. That's it. It seems to me like Americans, <clears throat> broadly speaking, are beginning to see that. I mean, they're punishing Republicans, certainly Republican policies, every chance they get at the polls. Uh, I think the, the latest Supreme Court decision in Arizona is a great case study of that and, and what's going right. to happen as a result. What is your prediction going into the uh, the 24 election? Um. I hate to, every time I make a prediction, I get it horribly I wrong. So I should just say whatever the opposite is. So let me, let me break it down like this. I can both quantify and qualify how Joe Biden gets reelected. Okay. That doesn't mean he will, but it means I can put together in my head the different coalitions in different states, you know, by number of how many votes he needs or what percentage of the vote he needs to get there. I can qualify why Joe Biden should be reelected, whether or not it's on fundamental decency calm policy whatever it is i can't quantify how donald trump gets reelected in my head because his coalition is smaller older whiter more male and more extreme than it was in 16 or 20. he's going out of his way to alienate republicans like i used to be by saying terrible things about nikki haley or flat out saying if you're a rhino i don't want you and the only qualification he has is his name is donald trump Right. And so I'd rather be on the Joe Biden side of that equation than the Donald Trump side of that equation. Um, and, you know, you, you, let me just say this, too, is that, yeah, money and politics doesn't buy you victory, but it buys you options and campaigns matter on the margins. Biden has a better campaign, better apparatus, more money. Trump has less money, less, you know, a, a more, you know, whacked out campaign. And he single handedly wrecked his own get out the vote operation by saying he doesn't believe in early or mail in voting. So like just on the mechanics and the logistics of it too, I see it's, I, I, I feel good about Biden, but you know, as you know, Ken, um, it's always the externality, 
right? Is is in to be a bit in politics? It's like Thurgood Marshall always said, you know, everybody always forgets about the girlfriend, right? It's always that thing out there that we're not expecting. What happens after this? I'm going to play the optimist for a second. Let's say we defeat Trump. We deliver the the harshest rebuke to Trumpism itself and relegate its adherence to the dustbin of history, the Stefanics and the the Johnsons and the others. I just I can't imagine you and I arguing the same way we would have ten years ago about the marginal tax rate. I mean, politics is going to be forever changed. It feels like we have stared into the abyss, and the things that seemed existential before won't going forward because we have seen democracy itself on the brink. Well, I think you're a hundred percent correct on that, um, and so I think it'll be. Look, I think that. Aside from Joe Biden, you know, Joe Biden's reelection being a bridge to the future, which, which is what he said he wanted to be in, you know, four years ago. I think it's also a bridge to a new and different American future yes. and, and potentially better. And I'll say this, you know, I just like I read a lot, as I mentioned, and I know you got to go in a minute, so I'll be this quick is um, and you, if you read a book that was written before COVID, they almost seem quaint, I right? Know. And so then you read a book that was written during or after COVID, and it's it's more real. And we're in the after times now, Ken. Like, if we get Biden back in the White House, we can officially say that the post-war era has ended, mm -hmm. right? The post-war era has ended. It was 80 years. Now, where are we going to go from here? What do we want to do? And we have big issues on the on the international stage, on the domestic front. Right. I mean, we could go we could go into hours and hours on, you know, the American economy and what that looks like. Big tech, all of this stuff. Right. All of the things that have, you know, the hydras that have allowed to basically maybe they're not governmental, but are corporate or otherwise in nature that have allowed to wrap themselves around the American people. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity for those discussions to be had. Uh, now, that being said, that doesn't mean MAGA will go away. And I think that Alabama with IVF and Arizona show you and with Florida, like ultra MAGA is a real thing and it has seeped into the old Confederacy into the mountain West. And so while we might've cut the head, the, 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 the head off the octopus, it's still got eight arms that are out there wriggling around. I'm mixing all my metaphors. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that still have to be taken care of. But I would say this is that that's a lot more doable with Trump gone because, and, and we've seen this throughout history, is that when the leader goes, right, when the leader goes, a lot of the a lot of the followers have almost a sort of Rip Van Winkle effect, like, what was I doing? What was I thinking? And suddenly they come back to the fore and then all of the nuttiest of the nuts who came out of the woods for, for Trump go back away because they said the whole thing was rigged anyway. I knew there was a reason I didn't participate. Yeah. Right. So I think there's a real opportunity to, to actually bring a lot of American voters back to sanity as well. I hope you're right, Reed. Uh, wonderful talking with you. What is your favorite all time Lincoln Project ad? We'll walk you out with that. Oh, gosh. Uh, oh, man. There's so many. Uh, I don't know. There's like 7,000 of them, so I couldn't even tell you. All right. I'll pick one for you. Good. Please Thanks. pick one for me. I'll pick yeah, one. Yeah, and for listen, you. I hope I hope everybody there will, you know, uh, check out the Lincoln Project podcast and check out my Substack, The Home Front. And Ken, thank you for what you and 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 Dan and everybody are doing. Absolutely, we'll put a link to all that in the show notes. Great having you, Reid. Thanks, Ken. When Donald Trump was president the first time, the Russians wanted him to win. He called him colorful, talented. He said, Donald Trump is the absolute leader of the U.S. presidential race. They helped him. He won. He never forgot it. He welcomed well, his support. I like that he said that. Over and over, Trump put Putin in Russia over American interests. The problem is not that Putin is smart. The real problem is that our leaders are dumb. He wants Putin to win in Ukraine. I said, this is genius. Told him Russia can do what it wants in attacking our NATO allies. I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. He doesn't have a good relationship with Putin. He owes Putin. Trump's not just on the other side. He's on the take.